Welcome to Cooking with the Queen. I was just pouring through these cookbooks here, um, left over from Queen Victoria's Day, and some wonderful recipes. You may have heard that I'm going to be on the telly, and they're going to film me, my mess, and my kitchen attached to the Royal Apartments, so I thought I would give you a taste of what's to come. I just love cooking for heads of state and other important guests. You never know who's going to drop in, perhaps the President of the United States, and I know he loves wild turkey. We normally like to uh, use wild turkey if one can get it, but uh, unfortunately my supermarket didn't have wild turkey. Now, normally comes with the giblets and neck. Ooh. Now, we would normally chop very finely onions, place those around the pan, it's about two onions, a couple of stalks of celery, sprinkle, sprinkle those in two, and out of preference, sweet pepper. Now, the herbs. I obviously like sage, rough sage, I don't like the really ground sage. Just rough sage. A couple of handfuls there, and we would put a little bit of clove, a little bit of nutmeg, a little salt, a little pepper. Actually, no salt because we're going to use chicken stock or oxo cube, whichever you can get hold of. All this goes in beforehand. It's going to cook with the turkey. And fill it up with water. As much water as you can get into the pan, because you don't want the pan to dry in the oven. I don't pull my turkeys out and baste. I just leave them in the oven, throw them in for a couple of hours, with lots of water in there and just a little bit of oil or a knob of butter on top, like that. That helps the basting, but that's very important because this tends to, to uh, heat onto the foil and baste the turkey itself, self-baste. A little foil and into the oven, just like that. We put it in the oven at 375, 400 degrees. I like to cook fast and leave it there for two hours. Don't open the oven, just leave it there, we'll check it later. Pudding, Christmas pudding, plum pudding. Mix this all in, call for a little bit more liquid, I think, because it's a still a dry mix. I put a lot more fruit in than a pound. That's what we've done, but there the old queen gets in with her, with her hands, no rings, mind you. <laughs> you lose them in the pudding. Now, one of the things we used to do in the old days was to put in little silver threepenny bits. And we would wrap those in like a um, greaseproof paper. Or you can put charms in, you can put diamond rings in. So, I think this is ready. Let's turn the whisk on. Look at that, lovely and frothy. There's nothing in it, just, just whites of eggs, no sugar or anything like that. And we're going to put the Guinness in. Now, the, uh, so you can substitute Guinness with um, sherry, more, more brandy perhaps. Rum, why not rum? This is going in the sauce, the rum sauce. Let's put some rum in, let's have some fun with this. Going to fold those in too. There we are, they won't just come out, do they? It's a very rich pudding, isn't it? I'll just fold those in, look at that. I suppose I should be saying something while I'm doing this, shouldn't I? This is all I'm losing. <laughs> there we are. Going to have muscles, this old queen. It's supposed to be nicely, lightly folding this in, but it's almost like a cement mixer, isn't it? Well, see? Coming together. Coming together nicely. Okay. I could put a few diamond rings in here, couldn't I? You know, three carat, you name it. So you would wrap the Christmas pudding in muslin. 
here we are, we've got a nice piece of the royal bed sheet. Well washed, well rinsed, don't want any soap in there. And we'll make our Christmas puddings. Like that. Put a couple of little blobs in there. And tie this together, just like that. Whoops. That was the royal corgi. Did you hear it in the background? I did. <laughs> Bottom one again. Now, one of these really tight, so let's do the brrr, bottom one like that. Do the top one like that. Bottom one again. And then the top one. And there we are. And there's one lovely pudding. We're going to put that, look at it. We're going to put that into the steamer. And we're going to steam it for six hours. And there we are, the finished product. I've taken the turkey out of the roasting tin and I'm going to put the roasting tin on the stove, on the hot light, to bring it up to the boil. And then we'll make the gravy. Now look at that, isn't that just gorgeous? That's cooking, the water method. To check to see if the turkey's ready, this turkey has been in for approximately, just over two hours actually, at 400 degrees, it's about a 12 pound turkey. And we just pull the leg away from the breast, just cut down a bit. And if there's still blood in there, it's not ready. And Therefore, we just have to put it back into the oven. But that one, just perfect. And this lovely meat. Let's look at that. Moist, not dry, nice and brown. I didn't take the foil off for the last 15 minutes. Sometimes I do that. But just look at that. Succulent. Goodbye. Oh, I do hope he doesn't get in next term. I'm fed up at doing turkey. As you know, I'm also the Queen of Scotland, and my favourite home is Balmoral. I often cook for the Duke of Argyll haggis. Now, beware, I am known for my exploding haggis. Oh, dear. Now, the only way I can do haggis is to have fun with it, because it is quite an extraneous dish to make. And look at it. I mean, just look at it. I'm going to... Oh, the Queen's got a heart. A heart. Look at that. The Queen's likes a little bit of tongue. <laughs> There's two of them. The Queen's been drinking a little bit too much, you know. There's her liver. Not a very nice sight. And how about little kidneys? Little kidneys. Look at that. Isn't that a little... Oh, we can make a little face. Little tongue. Two kidneys for an eye. Little beard. There we are. And some hair. Does that look all right? There we are. Let's talk a little bit about haggis first. The North Countrymen, probably Lancashire, Northumbria, who's to say, Yorkshire, they always made things like blood pudding, faggots in Lancashire in particular, and I'm sure that they made haggis too. And how did the Scots pick it up? They threw them as projectiles over Adrian's wall. Anyway, we're going to do the Scottish haggis, trim all the pieces from the meat. So this is lamb and kidney, and we want to cut or mince as small as possible. Look, really small, so we'll have to do that and do that, and then do them all together. And as I said, it's a tedious job. But I like chunky bits in my haggis. The mincer, no, it's not a sausage. It's almost it's like a pudding. It is a pudding. And so we're going to do all this meat like that. The skin, Take, have to take the skin off the, um, off the tongue. Now, the first time I ever had haggis was when I was visiting the gamekeeper to Sir Alec Douglas Hume's estate. And he lives in Moffat, Dumfrieshire. And Mr. Long served haggis to me, and it was served with fried egg on top. Just one of those peculiarities. And this huge glass of very good single malt whiskey so the old queen sat at the table and s drank the whiskey in one. And everyone looked at me appalled. And someone mentioned mom. That was supposed to be poured on the haggis. 
So everybody else drank their whiskey, just to be in form, and that was a very jolly party. So that was my first experience with haggis, and what an experience that was. But I would never have it with fried egg on top again. I mean, that was one of the peculiarities of either the Long family or Dumfrieshire. Very strange part of the world, you know. <laughs> Nearly finished. Oh, dear, this poor old queen. We should have people to do this, shouldn't we? But they all got the day off, you know. When I'm in the kitchen, they all scrounge away. The servants take the day off. They go for little boat rides on the serpentine, you name it. There we are now. Very thirsty work in the kitchen, you know. I always make sure that the servants have supplied me with a tray of drinks. By the time we finish this show, we'll be down on the... <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> By the time we finish this, we'll be down on the floor with our legs up in the air. <laughs> Think it's big enough? I hope so. This is going to make about uh, two or three haggis, you know. All in there. Dirty ha Oh, missed a bit there. There we are. Let's scrape all that up. Could be a little more finely chopped than that, silly old queen. Look at it. But nice meat. I mean, that's, uh, that's the important thing with haggis. Now we're going to add the other ingredients. And we're going to use oat meal. This is medium. It can be coarser, but throw that in. That's just over a pound. Same with suet. As I say, I'm going to make about three haggis out of this suet. What's suet? Mm. Well, it's the fat from around the, the kidney, and it's ground by the butcher. Let's season it. Let's put some um, fine herbs. I mix these up myself. And salt and pepper. Tiny little bit. Remember what I say about cayenne pepper. I always cook with it, but you don't use much because it's not paprika. It's strong. Now, oh, we've forgotten something. The onions. There we are. Four onions finely chopped. Did all that beforehand, wasn't I clever, queen? There we are. Okay. And then it mixes with all the blood and juices that come out of the meat. And the suet will then mix in with that and creates what is known as haggis. Lovely. There we are. Now, where's the muslin? The royal bed sheet. Mm -hmm. Hold on, just a moment. Oh, it's here. There we are. As I say, once again, the royal bed sheet. Washed, double washed, treble rinse, no soap in it. We're running out of bed sheets at this rate. And then we'll put in the haggis mix. Don't forget, forget, this is going to swell. If you were doing the sheet's stomach, you would only fill it three quarters full. Then you'd sew it together and throw it into boil, because this mix boils for three hours. And you'd have to do that or the thing would explode. You've all heard of the joke of exploding haggis. Well, that's what it's all about. So there's one haggis. Wow, a lot, a lot of haggis. I mean, I'm going to have more haggis than we know what to do with. We're going to be able to serve the whole regiment of the Scots Guards. Now, watch what I'm doing. Once again, tying it under, tying it over, and tying it on top again. We don't have to be too tight because that's going to really swell up. And then we'll put that in the boiler. It looks a little sloppy, but that's all right. This way. <laughs> I don't want, th this pan has got nothing in it other than water. Now, I don't want the haggis to sit on the bottom of the stove or the pan, so I'm going to put a plate in the bottom to stop it from burning. In we go. Plop. Now that has to cook for three hours just boiling away merrily for three hours. But don't forget that within the first half hour, you have to prick them or they'll explode. And we don't want exploding haggis all over the walls of the royal kitchen, do we? So there we are. Lovely. And here we are, the finished haggis, three hours later. 
Right, so this one's cooled down a little bit. But we're going to chop off its ears, make it look something like a sheep's stomach. And it didn't explode in the cooking, did it? Put it there. Now, we would normally serve haggis with tatties and nips. That's potatoes and turnips boiled and mashed together. Beautiful. And then spoon out the haggis and pour, no, pour this over the haggis just like that. And may I introduce you to Willie? We named him after Prince William since he's a little nipper. Nothing like a sip of good scotch. Uh, for medicinal purposes, of course. And speaking of scotch, I make a wonderful scotch broth. We want really sharp knives today. There we are. If we don't have a sharp knife, we'll be cutting the royal fingers. Now, a boner. We need the boner because we are going to make scotch barley broth. We will take some veal. I'm using veal shoulder pieces. You can use veal, uh, lamb, uh, mutton, anything that goes bar, and this is going to be trimmed, sliced, and put into the pan. Now, we're going to put the bones in too. So let's get all the meat off the bones. There we are, into the pan. Into small chunks, I would say about an inch. There we are. Don't know what we're going to do with that. Shall we try this? There we are. <coughs> Karate queen. No, it's not going to work. Let's throw it in there. We'll just scrape the meat off afterwards when it's cooked. There we are. A few ribs there, too. Where did they come from? There. All into the pan. Now, this is going to go onto the stove and cook for two hours. Or un until till tender, whichever comes first. Scotch broth is a very hearty soup, good for the cold weathers walking around the corridors of the palace. But I'm also going to use this dish as a main course as well. I shall thicken it, take out the meat, thicken some of the sauce, and make it as a main course also. So there we are, in with the meat, in with the barley now. I'm using pearl barley, but you can use a Scottish barley, which is much uh, uh, probably much uh, larger than that, and would take a, lot, a long time to cook. And cover that with water. Quite a lot of water in there. A little bit more. Ooh, messy, don't want too much. We'll boil over, and to the stove. Now we'll put that on the stove and bring it up to the boil, and skim it. And let it boil. We can put the lid on as well. Let it boil for two hours. Look at that. But look at all the scum on the top. Let's get a little cloth here. That has to come off. Skim it away. We don't want to take any of the barley. And I haven't seasoned this yet. Uh, I'm going to put in a couple of bay leaves. That's my choice. It's not in many recipes. But I do like to have some flavor in this dish, you know. <laughs> there we are, a little stir, a magic stir from the Queen. <laughs> so, in with the celery. In with the onions. And the turnips. Lovely. We may have to add a little extra water as we go along, because it's cooking away like mad, isn't it? Look at that. Pity Charles can't eat this dish, you know. He eats a vegetarian. So I suppose we can always take all the meat out and just call it a barley broth. But, uh, there we are, it's getting very thick. Now, here's the presentation and finishing. And this could be a dish fit for a queen. There's the soup, 
I'm going to ladle that into soup bowl for service. Look at those lovely chunks of meat. Turnips and celery. We should have some Scottish music while we're doing this, shouldn't we? There we are. Then just um, garnish that with sprinkling very roughly chopped parsley. I'm not even going to do it any less than that. Yeah, doesn't that look lovely? Mmm. And here we are with the entree. And just pour, just pour the sauce over it for service. Beautiful. Fit for a queen. Thank you. Oh. <laughs> and so there you are, royal viewers. A small sampling of what to expect in my new cooking show, Cooking with the Queen. Be sure to check out my website, cookingwiththequeen.com. I knight you, Sir Deep Rob Pound. I'm your queen, I don't carry money.